development think tank um, called the Center for Policy Research. Uh, we're here to introduce a book uh, that uh, both of us have worked on with Ugarte, who was head of Security Council Report in New York, very well known to the UN community, also as a former ambassador of Costa Rica uh, here and sitting on the Security Council and as a foreign minister of his country. Uh, this volume uh, comes out at a time of renewed uh, great power rivalry, and Sebastian will talk about that a bit in a second. Um, I would simply like to flag that uh, a similar volume came out 11 years ago in 2004, um, but the content of this one is completely new. Uh, very few of the authors returned as authors. Only four of them repeated their topics. We repeated only two situations in this volume, uh, mainly because they continue to hang over the Security Council in terms of lessons learned, but also perhaps lessons still to be learned. And those two repeat cases are Iraq and the Balkans, both of which uh, remain um, occasionally uh, tense in the case of the Balkans and very often uh, in difficulty in the case of... I think I'll start there, Sebastian. I'll stop there, Sebastian. So why don't you go ahead? Terrific. Thank you. Um, this book is called Security Council in the 21st Century. It's an apt title because it really looks at key trends and developments that have marked the Council since 2000. And uh, embarking on this, this uh, project, it was quite remarkable to uh, the Council of the past 15 years is a different Council from the Council of the first post-Cold War um, decade. And there are a number of uh, longer-term trends that make that council different from the 90s, including the rise of the terrorism agenda, increasing uh, uh, controversies around the responsibility to protect that was also agreed on early in the decade, um, the divisions that emerged over the Iraq war that continue to uh, uh, linger, um, and the resurgence of peacekeeping, which started around 99 and which saw a tenfold increase in troops um, over the past 15 years. Now the area covered by UN peacekeepers and uh, uh, politicians is twice as large as the Roman Empire at its peak. But I think the most consequential uh, new development that we have seen um, over, over the past decade or so is a return of east-west tensions that have caused fears of a return of Cold War paralysis in the Security Council. And I think the most um, significant manifestation of this is a return of the veto, the rise of the use of the veto by Russia and China. Since 2007, we have seen four lone vetoes by Russia, uh, two on Ukraine, one on Srebrenica, one on Georgia, and six double vetoes by China and Russia, four on Syria, one on Myanmar, and one on Zimbabwe. And those six double vetoes are quite remarkable if you compare that with the fact that in the preceding 35 years, basically since Beijing replaced Taiwan at the UN in 1971, there has been only one single double veto um, uh, cast by Russia and China. Now, this development is all the more disheartening if you um, remember that as recently as five years ago, we seem to be entering a golden period of Security Council activism with the arrival of the Obama administration, which promised a return to multilateralism, promoted a reset with Russia, courted China, and seemed to have more interest in ending old wars rather than starting new ones. And I think initially um, Obama's approach paid off in the council, in the council and outside the council. But in the council, it paid off in the following ways. We saw strengths and sanctions on DPRK, on their nuclear issue. 
We saw significantly strengthened sanctions uh, against Iran with Resolution 1929, um, as the US administration at the time touted it, the strongest sanctions, toughest sanctions ever. Um, and I think there is a strong argument to be made that the Iran deal a few months ago would have been impossible without Resolution 1929. Um, it also paid off in terms of um, enlisting Moscow's and Beijing's consent for the use of force under the banner of responsibility to protect, not only in Libya, everybody knows about that, but also in Cote d'Ivoire in 2011 in the context of the um, electoral standoff there. But as we all know, things went downhill from there, uh, starting with the acrimony over the way NATO implemented the Libya mandate, followed by deadlock over Syria, and reaching a low point with the Ukraine crisis. Um, now, here in New York, much of that tends to have been attributed to backlash over, over Libya, over the Libya intervention. But I think that is a too narrow uh, interpretation that ignores both the wider set of motivations that, that led Russia to block on Syria, um, and also ignores a deeper set of causes that explains the renewed East-West tensions. And among those causes is a more longer-term backlash by Russia and China and also the broader non-aligned movement at the UN against Western redefinition of sovereignty, R2P being the most uh, significant manifestation of that, as well as a common interest of Russia and China to use the Security Council has dramatic economic rise over the past 15 years, uh, which saw China becoming in 2010 the second largest economic power and the year after the largest energy importer. That translates both into a more assertive China, and a China that has interests to defend in parts of the world where it had been, by and large, absent as recently as 15 years ago. Finally, a more fundamental reorientation of Russian foreign policy uh, that we saw emerging with the return of Putin to the presidency in 2012. Um, uh, and him following a much more uh, confrontational stance towards the West, which Putin cast as deliberately blocking uh, Russia's rightful reemergence as a great power. Now, while I don't want to downplay the malaise that these developments have thrown the Security Council into, um, we're still far away from Cold War paralysis. Number one, uh, China and Russia do not constitute a voting bloc. China does not automatically rally to the side of Russia in the Council, as we have seen when it denied Russia company uh, for its vetoes on Georgia, Ukraine, and Srebrenica. Also, China, I think, has in recent years shown very encouraging signs of being interested in constructive engagement at the UN on a number of files, most visibly so on peacekeeping. Um, it has, uh, uh, I think it's among the top 10 uh, troop contributing countries. And just uh, a couple of weeks ago at the peacekeeping summit convened by President Obama, it made the stunning announcement of 8,000 additional, additional troops. But it's not confined to peacekeeping. We also see China engaging very constructively on climate change uh, and on SDG financing with their uh, amazing pledge of a billion dollar a few weeks ago. Um, also, it's quite remarkable um, to see the council members continuing with their ability to compartmentalize issues and isolate their disputes to certain files. Um, for 
uh, new incoming members of the council, non-permanent members, they were stunned when they saw the P5 butting each other's heads on one file and an hour later meet on a different file in a different room and be best friends. Uh, and that continues to a degree, although I am a little concerned about signs of spillover. Um, spillover where um, uh, some, some files that used to be fairly uncontroversial have become more controversial. Um, and I think the final sign that the P5 uh, uh, continue to maintain the ability to work together even on, on strategic files is of course the Iran deal and the implementation of the Iran deal uh, in a subsequent Secur Security Council resolutions. Also, divisions um, over Syria and Ukraine have not interrupted two very remarkable trends in the Security Council of the past 15 years that do not get much attention. Number one, a remarkable rise in Security Council uh, decision-making by consensus. Actually, uh, over the past decade, 90% of Security Council resolutions have been adopted by consensus. The second remarkable trend uh, more striking, actually, is the rise in Chapter 7. A lot of people have written about the rise of the use of Chapter 7 in the 90s, but the true rise of Chapter 7 actually has only occurred since 2000, with 25% of council resolutions adopted under Chapter 7 in 2001, and over the past five years, consistently, that share has been over 60%. Um, a fun little fact, uh, in 2014 alone, more Chapter 7 resolutions have been adopted than in the Council's first 30 years of existence. Now, these figures reflect that the Council, that the P5, even today, have a shared interest in maintaining uh, the desire, in, in maintaining the Council as a functioning instrument in areas where they have converging interests. And they continue to have converging interests in very important areas that constitute an important part of the Council agenda. Syria notwithstanding, crisis management, crisis management in Africa in particular, and that convergence of interests has only been strengthened with the uh, uh, rise of the terrorist threat in a large number of uh, uh, mission settings, in settings where the, country, uh, where the Council deploys peace operations. Second, the counterterrorism in general, uh, counterterrorism agenda in general, unites the P5 more than it divides them. Again, current disagreements um, over counterterrorism operations in Syria notwithstanding. Um, and third, non proliferation. Negotiations over DPRK and Iran are tough. Yes, China and Russia tried to, um, over the years, water down sanctions resolutions. But still, fundamentally, the P5 share the common interests of keeping the club of nuclear weapons states at its current number. Um, and finally, the, area, uh, the, the issue area of organized crime um, has uh, 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 crept on the Council's agenda increasingly over the past decade, and that's also an area where, where, where the P5 interests converge. Final point I want to make is that all the focus on the divisions among the P5 in the Council um, overshadows the important fact that in the day-to-day -day business of the Council, the division that matters far more is the division between the permanent five and the elected ten members of the Council. The domination um, of the P5, especially since the end of the Cold War, has always been stark. E10 complaints about P5 collusions we have heard since the early 90s, but that has gotten much stronger. The domination of the P5 of the Council has, has gotten stronger, and it's very hard for the elected 10, even for very active, committed, able um, E10 with a strong diplomatic staff in New York to leave a mark is uh, uh, quite limited, especially on country-specific files. Now, within the P5, the ones who rule the show is the P3, um, while Russia and China generally adopt the wait and see uh, attitude. Um, the stranglehold um, of the P3 on the Council has only been uh, strengthened with the emergence of the so-called pen holder system, whereas the P3 hold the pen and the drafting 
of uh, a council resolutions and they guard that, um, uh, uh, they guard that pen quite jealously. Um, a final uh, a cynical message of hope um, is that f for all the divisions we see in the council, one, one may be heartened by the unity of purpose and solidarity we do see among the P5 in killing off any initiatives um, that would uh, weaken their grip on the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'd be delighted to answer any questions on this or other aspects of the council. Evelyn, please. Okay. Uh, um, I think I'm, uh, Russia seems to be adverse to sanctions since sanctions were placed on it uh, over Ukraine, over Crimea, and so forth. And that seems to be reflected on South Sudan and other places since then. I'm curious your thoughts. Also, um, when you look at the world falling apart in North, in Africa and in the Middle East, you see a helplessness of the UN moving in baby steps, even when it, part of it is the division in the council, but part of it is just a certain helplessness, and it diminishes the council in the eyes of the world. Should I take the first and you take yeah, the second? Yeah, by all means. Okay. Um, on, on sanctions. It's interesting that um, among UN experts, um, the 90s are often referred to as the sanctions decade uh, because, of course, the 90s saw that dramatic rise in the use of sanctions starting from zero in, uh, in 1990 to around a dozen by the end of the decade. Um, but that ignores the fact that actually the number of sanctions regimes has consistently been, uh, been rising and we now have 16 sanctions regimes in place, 12 of which were uh, adopted since 2000. And um, Russia's um, belly aches with sanctions didn't only start with the Ukraine crisis. China and Russia have always been very sovereignty conscious and always um, signaled their discomfort with sanctions, coercion, use of Chapter 7. And China in particular has always made the point um, during the 90s, um, yes, uh, we agree with those sanctions um, in, in, and we go along uh, with those sanctions in, in, in a case that they would normally see as uh, intervention in internal affairs, but this is an exception. So this was always seen as an exception. Now, um, and 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 you know, if you if you see the negotiate the sanctions negotiations in in Darfur mid decade on DPRK and Iran starting in two thousand and six, they have always f been really tough. And um, even where sanctions resolutions were adopted, um, they were always watered down quite a bit because of China's and Russia's issues. Um, with sanctions. Um, but again, the, the number of sanctions regimes still, still rose. Now, um, I, I do think that now th there, Russia's uh, uh, um, attitude to sanctions has indeed um, uh, turned negative quite a bit since, since the, since the uh, sanctions imposed by the EU against them over Ukraine. Um, and we have, and this is one area where I've, I've, I've mentioned before my concerns about spillover. This is where we have seen spillover. Last year, we have seen uh, the high-level review on sanctions um, that was member state-led, that was meant to lead to um, uh, very sensible reforms in the way sanctions are adopted, designed, and implemented. And um, unfortunately, the outcome of that was um, uh, sank by Russian opposition, and this is a manifestation of that they've turned even more negative on sanctions. Um, the thing is that part, part of the reflection of the fact that China and, Sasha, um, uh, China and Russia have issues with sanctions is the fact that the nature of sanctions have turned in, in, in recent years. Um, we see far less sanctions imposed against sitting governments and far more sanctions regimes that are cast in support um, of governments and imposed against spoilers. 
Um, and if I'm not mistaken, of all sanctions regimes currently in place, the one um, on Eritrea, DPRK, and one other are actually sanctions against the sitting government. Um, so I agree with you, but I would nuance it a little bit. Great. And uh, your interesting question on perceptions of council effectiveness, which of course then uh, shade into the UN's effectiveness, because if the council isn't effective, the UN on security isn't effective. Uh, there I'd say um, uh, there's lots of blame to go around. Um, I'm personally of the view and have been of that view for a long time that NATO made a basic mistake in Libya in over-interpreting its mandate. It was a mandate that was clearly uh, about the protection of civilians. It was expanded by the NATO powers to include regime change. That ended very dramatically and very uncomfortably, I think, for many member states of the UN with the grisly death of Gaddafi, whose uh, convoy had been stopped by a NATO aircraft. Uh, and we haven't heard much from NATO capitals since then about uh, Libya. So there is a case where uh, President Obama did allude to it in his remarks to the General Assembly this year. Not a great deal of thought, to put it charitably, had gone into what next uh, in Libya. So that actually did place, I'd say, Western powers on a back foot. I agree with Sebastian that Syria is a case of its own. It's a major country at the heart of the Levant. It's um, uh, a, uh, a situation in which uh, the rise of ISIS, I think, is disturbing to many countries in different ways. But I think it's very disturbing to Russia because of the connection with Chechnya and uh, the, the um, uh, Russian Federation's uh, own Islamic uh, territories. Uh, but I don't think Libya helped, frankly. I don't think it uh, reflects much credit in the aggregate on uh, the NATO powers, even though I strongly believed and still believe it was worth protecting the civilians in Gez Benghazi, which w is what had been authorized. Uh, in Africa, there are new s situations on the ground. I'd say the slowest moving, but perhaps most important in terms of the Security Council's decision making, has been the emergence of the African Union as um, a necessary partner. Uh, the African Union keeps reminding the Security Council that unless Africa is consulted, the Union, on strategies that the Council is considering adopting on Africa, the African Union will feel no obligation to support these strategies. So in a way, the Council has been learning how to deal with that. We also see complex uh, deployments on the ground, often involving a Western power, uh, generally France, able to deploy very quickly to the ground to prevent the worst from happening. For example, in Mali, sometimes in the Central African Republic, then joined by a mix of UN personnel sometimes sub-regional African organization personnel, sometimes African Union personnel. So a very complex identity of, uh, and messy identity quite often, of interveners uh, on the ground. So this is to be welcomed in terms of the rise of the African Union as an effective, coherent, uh, regional organization, which has much more to do with the Security Council than any other, um, but also because a number of the crises have blown up suddenly, because deploying quickly to crisis situations is difficult, um, very difficult for African governments. Um, you have hybrid deployments, uh, which I think are stressful for all concerned. Well, they do sometimes prevent the uh, worst. I think, uh, Evelyn, what you point to is 
confusion for the international public in the face of all of this because the public expects the UN to be effective. It is effective much of the time, but when it is, it doesn't create news. When the UN is unable to make headway on a major crisis like Syria, that is um, a perpetual news item over a period of two or three years, and that has genuine impact on perceptions of the UN. And that's something the Security Council needs to think about. It's something the United States, the Russian Federation, others actively involved, uh, Arab powers also need to think about because the Security Council uh, and the UN are such important instruments for member states. So if the member states allow the UN's credibility to erode, there's a cost to them, ultimately as well as to the UN as a system. Please. Hi, uh, Bing Xin Li from People's Daily uh, in China. Uh, thank you for your briefing. And um, uh, as far as I know, that uh, you, you, you mentioned that uh, there are more and more veto from China uh, in recent years. And, uh, but as far as I know that from my colleagues, uh, that China is not willing to to to, to veto in in the in a, in, in this kind of solution because uh, China prefer to solve some of the international challenges through consultation, through dialogue, through cooperation. So uh, my question is, uh, what do you think that um, all the countries can reduce the veto in the future mm -hmm. in the Security Council so that? This council can work in a effect, more effective way and more smooth, smooth way. Well, okay. I think, by the way, you're right that China's preference is to uh, talk about problems with those involved and to try to resolve them without division of the Security Council. Certainly, that's its historic record. Um, and uh, I think Sebastian made the point that it thinks very carefully about it vetoes, its vetoes. It doesn't always join the Russian Federation in vetoes. It seems to judge every situation on its own merit from Beijing's point of view. But the facts stand for themselves, which are more uh, Chinese vetoes recently than in its first uh, three decades occupying the Chinese seat at uh, the UN. I think, generally speaking, there is quite a lot of negotiation amongst the permanent five, quite a lot of discussion. There is nearly always an attempt to see if they can agree. Uh, that is the preference, I think, of all of them. Uh, but precisely because their interpretation of situations on the ground has grown apart uh, in recent years, vetoes have been uh, more frequent. So I'd say that would be my answer to your question. I have nothing uh, to Sebastian add. Sebastian <laughs> might have another. By the way, we have a very good chapter in the book by two Chinese scholars on China and how to interpret China's positions in the Security Council. So I would urge any of you to have a, at least a look at those, that chapter and also the chapter on Russia because there's a very good chapter by a Russian who interprets Russia's positions in the Security Council through the lens of upholding international law as far as the Russian Federation is concerned. Uh, so we did try to make sure that in the volume different points of view are reflected rather than boringly simply our own point of view. Linda, welcome. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Please. Linda herself, an author on the uh, council in book form. <laughs> and you, both of you, of course, <laughs> contributors. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry I came in late, uh, and you may have discussed this already, but I was just wondering um, how significant do you think it really is in terms of the P5 protecting themselves from um, criticism, et cetera, on issues of domestic concern, 
Russia, I mean, obviously Ukraine, China on uh, North Korea or Tibet, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, do you seriously think that there will be a reduction in the use of the veto? Uh, very hard for me to uh, predict the future, so to speak. Uh, what I will say is I think all countries in the Council should have a program of action, of positive action in the Council. What do we want to achieve positively? And by the way, the, the visit of President Obama recently was an illustration of that. President Obama came, he had a strong s speech to deliver, but he also had a separate meeting that was a helpful one on peacekeeping. Uh, that's a positive use of the Council. All members of the Council, including elected members of the Council, should have a positive agenda they will try to deliver on over a period of time. Why? Because it's possible, it's the best way to contribute to um, uh, the credibility of the Council, and it's often not particularly controversial, depending on what your program of action is. I think all of the permanent five have items of that nature, but they get overshadowed often by uh, disagreements on policy. I think um, countries don't like to veto because a veto is always a sign of failure, ultimately. It's, been a fail it's a failure to persuade others that your point of view deserves to be reflected in whatever the draft uh, resolution is. Um, it's a failure to convince, and th there's always an, an element of, um, I'd say, unhappiness amongst those vetoing. I don't know of vetoes delivered with great joy because actually it means you're in a minority in the council if you have to veto. Uh, if you're in a majority, that wouldn't be the case. Uh, and there is discomfort in being um, a frequent uh, vetoer, I'd say, uh, which is why mostly uh, the, the Permanent Five try to avoid it. Um, in terms of being otherwise embarrassed uh, in the Council, um, I think the risk of advocating action then convincing the council to take action and then botching the action as happened with the follow-up to the protection of Benghazi in uh, Libya, that is a much worse embarrassment, it seems to me. So if you advocate certain actions, uh, you say you're going to do certain things, you do those things, but you wind up doing other things as well that really do make many actors in international relations, not just one or two per other permanent members, deeply uncomfortable, which the death of Gaddafi and the circumstances in which he died did make many member states of the UN deeply uncomfortable and also made the African Union deeply uncomfortable as a frequent partner of the, the uh, Security Council. That has consequences. And we, as I mentioned, I think before you walked in, Linda, uh, President Obama, I think rather bravely alluded to the fact that the follow-up to the protection of Benghazi hadn't been fully thought through. Um, uh, so quite brave of him to mention it. But the reality is it was a full-scale fiasco, uh, it seems to me, for NATO, uh, but also more widely for the UN, because the UN had been persuaded by NATO powers that this was the way to go. China and Russia were persuaded. They had reservations, clearly, that this was the way to go. And it didn't turn out at all as advertised initially. And there needs to be more recognition of that in the West, in my view, because that would help in relations with other powers on the Security Council. As all of us know, when we apologize or at least admit that perhaps we weren't fully transparent or successful, um, in carrying out a mission that we advertised as the solution to all problems, it helps in our relations with others. Please, sir. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, briefing.
I'm a little bit uh, baffled and surprised to see the title of the book, The UN Security Council in the 21st Century, and I haven't heard anything that reflects that title so far, either in terms of reforms, of restructuring of the council. The emphasis was on the veto and on sanctions. These are not the essence of the functions of the Security Council. They are negative forces. The essence of the Security Council is to the maintenance of international peace and security. In other words, to resolve conflict. And the widely held view outside of the organization is that the Council is in paralysis, not reaching consensus. And there is evidence to that. If you turned, you haven't mentioned at all the issue, for example, of the Middle East, which has known the application of the veto, or the veto uh, put for the uh, election, rather the non-election of one Secretary General. The multiplication of the veto is due to the extension of items before on the agenda of the Security Council, many of them do not really belong to international peace and security. What would you like us to respond to? By the way, I agree with a lot of your analysis, but how can we help you while we're here? My question here is, the book says the Council, Security Council in the 21st century, is this what you are developing, what you have said, or are there other things in the book that talk about restructuring of the council, reform of the charter, etc.? Thank you. The short answer is yes, so thank you very much for answering the question. Reform of the council is dealt with, and there are many positive aspects of the council's work that are dealt with, nearly all of which have problematic uh, elements. For example, Sebastian, uh, emphasized in his remarks that on African problems, which are perhaps 80 to 85 percent of the Council's agenda, uh, the Council has been able to agree nearly all those resolutions are adopted by consensus on strategies. But uh, when the Council agrees, it doesn't always make the news. When the Council disagrees, particularly when there is a veto, that uh, is the news. So yes, there's a great deal on reform of the Council. There is a chapter on the working methods of the Council that I found very interesting. I learned quite a bit from the author. Uh, there's quite a bit on other aspects of uh, Council reform. And I think there is intelligent discussion of the veto, but not as the dominant feature of the Council's life, because compared to the Cold War period, there are many fewer vetoes than there used to be, even if they picked up a little bit in recent years. Sebastian, yeah, what, to anything to add? But thank you for your analysis, because I think a lot of it is correct. Evelyn, please. <laughs> thank you. I forgot to welcome you on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association. It was like you and I were having our <laughs> private conversation here. Um, Benghazi had in that resolution the, the meaning like the Iraq Kuwait one. You can do everything, any means possible, mm. you know? So therefore, it wasn't restricted to not overthrowing the government. and. You know, the problem, I, I, I'm curious, the problem is the morning after in Iraq, in Libya, in any, after any military intervention. Mm. And it would be if they're in Syria, what happens the next day? Who's in charge? Mm. Um, secondly, uh, Sudan. Uh, the only overview seems to be the Khartoum government, whether it is on Darfur or on... Blue Nile or any of the other places, and no one get the council to budge. You know, the hybrid situation is not a good one, and uh, in Darfur, and even though there are indictments, they're not enforced. 
and there's no further action against Sudan, again, Russia and China, but maybe not just them, yeah? Thank you very much, uh, Evelyn. On your first point, you're right, of course. Uh, on the second point, the volume contains, I think, a very sharp chapter on Sudan by somebody you know, I think, uh, uh, who was at the German mission here after serving both the UN and his country in Sudan, uh, Heiko Nitschke. And I think it's a fairly unsparing analysis of uh, the multiple uh, challenges of Sudan, shading also, of course, into problems uh, in South Sudan as well. If, if I could just add one thing on, on, on your first question, which is the, the crisis of the um, R2P agenda is, of course, partly because there is this backlash against the redefinition um, of sovereignty among the more sovereignty conscious uh, members of the Security Council. But there is a flip coin to it, which is um, the lead country that would have implemented any use of force or 2 p uh, mandates, the United States, has dramatically lost its appetite to do so because of the experience of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya and the pottery barn principle of you break it, you own it. And owning those broken places is no fun. So while there is a lot of attention on Russia's and China's blocking attitude on Syria, it's not as if the US was lining up to be a taker for forceful action on that file. Great. And sir, perhaps one last one and, and uh, we'll be off. Thank you, Mr. Maron. You spoke about uh, dealing with reforms in the book, and I haven't had a chance to open the book yet. The charter says in this article 109, right after the adoption of the uh, charter in San Francisco in uh, June 45, that uh, there would be uh, a, an inter uh, a conference, a general conference to reform the charter 10 years after the adoption of the charter. Do you think that conference should be held now? Um, interesting question, honestly. I hadn't thought about it. I think any constitution, and the charter is the constitution of the UN, should be open for revision. Facts change, uh, circumstances change, and ideally const uh, constitutional documents are updated in most of our countries by constitutional amendments and so on. This has proved very difficult at the UN, partly because uh, charter amendment can be vetoed, uh, partly because the charter has actu was actually written rather well and lends itself to evolving interpretations. There is a school of legal thinking in the United States that the strength of the US Constitution is that it's a living tree. It sprouts new branches every now and then, and these branches redefine, in a sense, the tree as a whole, but they are, from the outset, a part of that tree. I think the UN has not been successful in, in viewing the Charter that way. Do I think there's a crisis at the UN because the Charter has not been reformed? No, I don't think so. I think that the member states have been fairly successful at making the Charter work during different periods in the way that were useful to them. But I'll turn to Sebastian on that. It's a very thoughtful question, and as I mentioned, I honestly had not given it any thought. If I had any hope that such a conference would lead to charter reform, and especially reform of the Security Council. I'd be very much in favor of it. Unfortunately, I am not. I agree with David. Um, we are not having a crisis, an acute crisis, um, because of the lack of reform. Rather, what we see is a slow erosion of the Council's legitimacy as a result of the lack of reform that will play out over time and slowly marginalize the mm -hmm. council. 
um, as an actor on the international scene. By the way, the council won't be marginalized in terms of its legal powers. Its legal powers are unique. Only the council can authorize coercive measures in a way that's binding on all states and, and many other actors as well. But what risks happening is that increasingly the active involvement of states who aren't permanent members is going to be required in strategies to address certain conflicts. And that suggests the action on conflict resolution in terms of design of a strategy will move outside the Security Council. And the Security Council will serve increasingly simply to bless strategies that have been developed that way. That is the medium and long-term risk to the Council, and the Permanent Five need to be aware of it. In resisting Security Council reform, they may actually kill the usefulness of the organization in which they hold so much power. Just a, a follow-up, please, on that. The Great. 